Hello, welcome to Lovolution Village. My name is Doctoress Newtopia, and I am a futurist. I'm actually the last futurist to have graduated from the University of Massachusetts. What happened is they destroyed my program, which is why I'm the last futurist. And it was a great program. We introduced solar panels into the class, uh, rooftops on classrooms, and also introduced the computer into classrooms. So it was very innovative. People from all over the world came to this program. And it was experimental. There was no grades that was given. But during the Reagan administration, they started cutting back on public money to universities. So they cut out future studies. And it was deliberate. It was an ideological reason why they cut my program. And they also cut public health at the same time, as well as art education. Now, why would they do that? Well, my program, Future Studies, actually, it was involved with allowing freedom for the individual to study what you wanted to study. So what I chose to study was art and utopia. During my time at the University of Massachusetts, I developed a image of a utopian society that I would like to live in. And since that time, I have been trying to manifest that vision. That's why I have this television show, to be an educator of this vision of how we can bring the world together in a new way that ends poverty, homelessness, disease, addiction, all these things that stop humanity from being alive, well, happy, and self-actualized. Or we're going even further than that, a global actualization. That's what we're trying to birth here at this moment of time, 2012, the big year of the big birth. So as a futurist, I go, I've just had a lot of trouble being able to find places in which to speak. The universities don't have any future studies programs. The school systems don't teach future studies. Yes, they teach history, but history will not give us the knowledge that we need in order to evolve. We have to use our intuitive powers. We have to look at the best practices on the planet to be able to come together in this inventive way that it requires now uh, for us to build this new great society. And we have to think of work in a different way. Work as terms of liberation of the individual, liberation of society, not the slaveocracy in which we live under a capitalist society ruled by the plutocrats. Plutocrats is the rule of wealth. And this is what the Occupy Tucson is all about. It's looking at that 1%, uh, how much wealth that they have, and what do they do with it. They certainly don't share it, so we have uh, public education for everyone, or public health for everyone. So there's a distribution of wealth problem. That's why people have gathered. There are 50 occupies still left in the United States that are functioning. Well, so when I got back from India after my two-month trip, I was all fired up. I wanted to join the Occupy Tucson. So during this time, they made a park move. They went to the De Anza Park on Speedway and Stone. And that was in walking distance to my house. So I thought to myself, my goodness, I can walk to the new world. How wonderful. So I volunteered to be the, to guide meditation and yoga every day in the park. And that's where, what I have been focusing on now is uh, becoming uh, more involved with yoga, more involved with the integration of uh, the city, uh, more of the new pattering, pat patterning has come forth within me. Uh, 
so that I can really see the connection of where the future needs to go and how we can get there by having these revolutionary movements in each town that, is, that the focus is on building the sustainable ecological city. So the vision is really coming forth in me. Now I'm going to start this slideshow and talk about some more of this vision. So the reason why they decided to come to the park is because the Congress has said that it will not prohibit uh, the free exercise of freedom of speech, the press, the right of the people to peacefully assemble. Now, I want to particularly say peacefully assemble. That is very important to the First Amendment. That means that nonviolent revolutions can happen in our country because we have the right to a pet petition our government for to look at our grievances. And the Declaration of Independence also states this, that uh, any form of governance becomes destructive to those ends it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. Now, this is the purpose of Occupy movement. It is to live out our constitutional rights, to peacefully assemble, to petition our government, and to form a new kind of government. Now, this whole new form of government that has been developing in these parks is called direct democracy. They have this uh, general assembly system set up so that people can bring in proposals about what they want to do. They can talk about the philosophy and politics of the movement. And then there are specific working groups to make this new organization function with success. Well, so we get down to the park now. I put this image in because you see that earth flag. Well, I, that is the earth flag that I purchased somewhere. And I thought that really our symbol as occupiers is the planet Earth. And what we need to do is realize that we are trying to occupy sacred space. That's what's been taken away from us. This whole idea that the planet is all sacred, that there are no toxic waste sites on it, that the land and water is too precious to ever pollute it. So that's part of taking back our rights, is to see ourselves as sacred beings. And this is what the meditation that I was focusing on and what yoga does is to bring us back into that sacred body. And I, I particularly learned a lot when I was doing this meditation and yoga in the park. And one of the things is that the meditation that I was doing was really about tuning in to the divine feminine. And for men, it is tuning into that half of them that is female, that has that female part of the, the DNA. It's a different kind of meditation than the masculine uh, meditation. It's, it's soft, it's getting into bliss. And that's where I was in that park. The, uh, this whole Occupy, uh, has been forced out of parks. We were in Armory Park. The police shut down that. And then they went to the park uh, near Congress Street, and they shut that down. But the protesters, who are now becoming very savvy with uh, laws, they found out that they can legally protest 
on a sidewalk. In Arizona, you can protest, you can on the sidewalk. And I thank uh, Reverend Tom, who has been taking care of the homeless for years and years, who really enlightened us about this. And you can even sit down. You don't have to be standing all the time on the sidewalk as long as you are there uh, for your protest. So that's what they did. And they called it the hard grounders. The hard grounders were who was uh, sleeping on the sidewalk for, I don't know whether it was a month or how long. I was in India at that time. And a lot of them were homeless people. They had nowhere else to go. And this was their, really, salvation uh, to be able to uh, band together for the cause of trying to regain civil rights or gain them for the first time because we've always had homeless people and people who have not fit into this unjust system. Now here is actually two of the meditation uh, folks. Uh, at one day I took this photograph. There is the earth flag and in the center of that earth flag we put an apple. And this, to me, is how the park should have functioned. Every morning we get up, we do our exercises, yoga, or whatever exercise it is, and then have a group meditation, which you can come and go at your free will. And you can meditate on whatever you like, um, as long as it brings you a mind state of peace and harmony and getting along with each other. But the problem was that many people in the camp were not really there for the Occupy movement. And many of the occupiers, like, don't want to believe in, you know, divine feminine. And so we have this problem with a spirit in the park. Um, and this is a, a, doesn't bring us together in this uh, collective holiness that we need to create an integral system. And it was located in a great place because it was near Pima College, so we could have uh, had our, if we were more organized, we could have brought questions, research questions out to uh, people and for them to go research. So this is some of the protesters who had done their own research because they wanted to find a piece of land that they could start growing things and have an intentional community. Uh, what happened when I first joined the Occupy was that at Armory Park, that first weekend when it started, there were maybe 200 people there. And of course, when you had that many people, they just weren't all homeless people without any money. These were middle class people who were concerned that their civil rights and human rights were being taken away by the corruption of this government. And so they were out there. We had professional people out there. We had doctors. We had nurses. We had musicians, professional musicians. We had um, a, a whole variety of people. Architects were there. But by the time they took over De Anza Park, those people had, were not in the movement anymore. And somebody even told me, they said, no, nah, it's dangerous down in that park. We watch it on the internet. Well, that's really not enough to have a social movement if people are just watching it on their screen. Um, we, if we just think that we can live with ourselves and the computers in our houses and somehow overturn the system, it's not going to happen because it's occupying space. That's what we need to do. And it's not just cyberspace. It's actual space. What we're seeing is that there are some people who are, don't have any space anywhere. For example, the homeless people. They have become like shadows that we don't want to look at as a, as a culture. People don't want to relate to homelessness. They, they, there are, I heard that there are 7,000 homeless people in Tucson, and there are 100, 350 shelter beds. 
So we have all of these people who have nowhere to go after 10.30. 10.30 is this, you know, the pumpkin hour where they cannot be in the parks after that time because the government uh, doesn't want them uh, sleeping in the parks. And so where are they supposed to sleep? There is nowhere because either it's private property or it's public property. And public property means that they have to get out by 1030. Now, this is completely cruel. This is a completely genocidal system to not take care of our people. And a lot of these people who are homeless are there because they can't take care of themselves. They have mentally ill problems. They have violence issues. They have alcohol addictions. They have drug addictions. They have been living on the streets. They have gang culture. I have seen it, what it is going on out there. This was a real mind-opening experience to me to be able to see how living on the streets really is. And it is not fun. It's very harsh. It's cutthroat. And that's what happened to the park. Well, this was actually after um, they had this uh, meet the 99%, and it was outside of the library. And there weren't that many people that came there. And it was certainly not those same people who originally came to Armory Park. They didn't even show up to this. So there was a real disconnect that's happening for people. That they aren't getting involved with the movement the way we need you to. Now, uh, this was because of the professional class abandoned the movement. The money stopped coming in and the food donations stopped coming in. So you had this essentially homeless camp outside of De Anza Park on the easement there that we were told um, did, if you slept in the easement, you would not get a ticket for being in the park after 1030 because that's what people were getting. There were you know, more than 600 uh, citations given to people over the period in Armory Park and that other park uh, for violating the 1030 curfew. And so this was a way, this easement was a way for people to not break the law. So it was like this miracle that happened. How many parks have this easement? And then the reality set in. The drug culture. The addicts, the mentally ill, the violence, and the occupiers that were there for political reasons, it was like so everything was so traumatized there, and the lack of social workers there, the lack of psychologists, everything that these people needed to get themselves back as functioning adu uh, adults wasn't there. So the occupiers were having to take this on. And then there wasn't enough food. So this is uh, we, uh, a time that I went to the Baptist church to get some food. And here's another picture of people who are homeless. They like to give it out to homeless people. They give it out three times a week. I think it's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to people. And uh, I went several times to get food for the occupiers. And then there was power struggles going on in the camp. They had another camp set up right on that same easement called Occupy Public Land. Occupy Public Land was started by at least one of the people was John McLean, but he has taken on the leadership position. He doesn't hold general assemblies even though he, he says he is part of the Occupy Tucson, he's really doing his own thing. And he is not, he, he didn't participate in the whole idea of the nonviolence. So 
it, it, it became this power struggle between two camps. And uh, during this whole power struggle, this food bus came. And they served one meal to people. Eggs and potatoes, and I don't know if they've served any meat or not. But I got a chance to go inside the bus and videotape it and think more about how, I mean, the possibility of creating a movement when you have food is, is much more likely. Um, and then the police came and shut it down. So they had one meal, and then the police came in, shut it down because they said uh, they needed some kind of pub public health permit. Now, why do they care about whether there's a public health risk to the homeless people? They don't take care of them anyway. They just soon as they, they die, right? I mean, they're not giving them health insurance. They're not giving them a bed to sleep in. And then they're shutting down the food bus because of a health permit. So that's one way the genocidal system works. And then there was uh, a fight here. I uh, was there for uh, violent words between the two camps. And this man, Brad, was actually butted in the head. And there he is with his broken nose. And the, uh, during the month that the occupiers were at uh, De Anza Park, I read in one article that the police were called 24 times for different disturbances. So that's almost like a fight a day or something bad's happening. So the peaceful assembly, um, you know, we were never really able to do it. The peaceful assembly. So how do we get to a point that we can have a peaceful assembly where people have the ability to live together without addictions, without having to act out things with this trauma, with ego, with power struggles. How do we do that? This is our big question of how do we do that? And then a lot of people said there were government infiltrators who come in to make disturbances because they don't want this movement to grow. And there it was some of the aftermath of um, the violence. No one was arrested for the broken nose. So, you know, it just kept on going on and on. And then you had, this was one day that I saw, look, they're just sleeping in the park. There wasn't anything to do. There wasn't any creative projects. I was on the education committee trying to persuade the Occupy, let's get a video, um, a video projector so we can start teaching in the parks, holding workshops. This is the way we're going to make a movement is through education. And the, those of you who watch my show know I am ready to teach this theory of architecture, of housing as a human right. This is my heart's desire. I'm ready. I just needed the equipment. And that education has not happened. So the next phase of the Occupy is going to be all about education, bringing the Levolution forth, using yoga and meditation to calm the spirit, to collectivize our energies so we can function as a un unity. And here is uh, Jumping Jack, writing a list. He's a professional audio guy, and he was writing me a list of all the equipment we need so we can actually have amplification in the park. And then we can draw musicians. We can uh, have it so that our parks become our classrooms for the new world, for building the new society, the dream that brought us all together it's not just about money. It's about community. It's building this new community. And I'm ready to 
be part of this.